All right, everybody, let's get today's program started. Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's good to be with you, as always, for another edition of our program, this awesome place where we all gather around the glow of our YouTube screens for an opportunity to hear from some interesting people who do interesting things out there in the world of science and nature, technology, education, art, and even more sometimes. Uh, it's really great to be with you because we always have a good time. We gather, we learn new things, we have a good conversation about the new things that we're learning, uh, and it's always exciting. I enjoy every Wednesday that I get to, to do this program, uh, and it's always a fun thing to host and meet everybody and have you all in the chat saying hi, hello, and where you're viewing from. Uh, keep doing that. Stay active in the chat. It's good to see everybody chiming in. For today's program, we've got another fun one for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, snakes. Who likes snakes? Show of hands. Me, I like snakes. But, you know, you have conversations with people out there in the world, and not a lot of people do. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes is uh, I like to take the museum's ambassador animal snakes like to local tv stations and they don't like me to take the ambassador animal snakes to local tv stations uh for reasons being that uh some people are afraid of them some people don't like them but we try to have those conversations anyway uh somebody who does i'm assuming like snakes quite a bit is today's guest speaker everybody i want you to meet dr nikki cagle Dr. Kegel is faculty at the Nicholas School of the Environment at Duke University, which just so happens to be the best school of the environment uh, at Duke University. And I only say that because that's where my master's degree is from. Nikki, welcome to the program. Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really excited to join you. Anytime we can have guests from the School of the Environment at Duke is a good day. <laughs> Oh, I agree. All right. So I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. Let's see. And um, I've studied snakes formally for over 20 years. I've been a passionate advocate for snakes for as long as I can remember. And I have traveled the world to Australia, Peru, Cuba, and beyond to understand snakes better and understand people better too. I've done research much closer to home, investigating snakes in the prairies of Illinois and also in the Piedmont forests of North Carolina. So I have my own history of snakes and I'm sure everyone in the audience today does too. And everyone's story is a little bit different. And I'd like us first to attend to your story. So I have some images here that I'd like to use as prompts. So here's our first image. And I ask you all, feel free to add this to the chat box. What do you see? What is the story going through your mind when you look at this image? What does it remind you of? And how do you feel? Or how about this? Maybe this is an image that feels familiar or strikes you in a particular way. What do you notice? What do you notice about your own experience? Or maybe you're more familiar with these sorts of images of snakes comes up for you here? What questions do you have? Or about this object, it's one of my favorites. What do you see? What do you wonder? All right, so we all have our own relationships to snakes and we're gonna explore that a little bit more. Some of us have been inundated with negative images, some have positive associations. Some have negative experiences with snakes and others have positive experiences with snakes. Our history with snakes impacts who we are, impacts conservation efforts too. And that's why I wrote Saving Snakes. 
So for years, I've been grappling with parallel concerns. The first is that people seem less and less connected to the natural world, like plants, animals, and landscapes. But the natural world's disappearing and whole ecosystems are being destroyed. We're in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. I think one piece of the solution is to cultivate empathetic connection to the natural world. But I'm also concerned for and have a deep connection to and a, a sheer fascination with this group of animals that really makes some people's skin crawl. And that's snake. I love the way they move. I love their vulnerability and their ecology. They're amazing. And yet, despite how incredible they are, and I mean, these creatures can really do some fascinating things. They can unhinge their jaws. They essentially have two penises instead of one. They're so cool. But despite this, a lot of people don't want to see them, and they certainly don't want to protect them. And that's a problem, because snakes are not only fascinating, they're critical. They're critical to ecosystem function. They connect the food web. Okay, so I think we're ready to begin our journey. And the first point that I want to make is that snakes are fascinating, but we still know relatively little about them. So when I was a child, I grew up in Northern Illinois and we'd often head out into the woods for this little tract of prairie. And a clear memory for me is walking through an old field with my dad and lifting up half rotten plywood boards and peering beneath them. And there's just this tremendous sense of adventure and excitement. What would be underneath? So we'd lift one board and look beneath it, and then nothing. And we'd lift another board that was scattered somewhere in this like old half acre, nothing. And then we'd lift a board and find it, a beautiful snake decked out in black and yellow stripes, a garter snake. So for me, that moment of curiosity led to another and another. Will there be a snake under the next board? What do snakes do under there? Why? 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 Why are they there? Is this where they sleep? Do snakes sleep? Is this where they eat? What do they eat? How many snakes are there? So in this, curiosity is the starting place. Curiosity is due to conservation and compassion and maybe civil civilization too. So effective conservation requires us to expand our world views. When I was 13, I began to volunteer at the Grove. It's a nature center in, in Northern Illinois, like literally kind of across the street from the neighborhood I grew up in. And I would clean tank and feed salamanders and snakes and talk to visitors. And it was wonderful. It was a wonderful place to volunteer. And in high school, I even got a proper job as a naturalist at the Grove. And during my downtime, I'd often sit in front of this large glass tank full of water snakes. And the water snake tank stretched from floor to ceiling. The bottom half of the tank was filled with fish and they included minnows and the water snakes could hunt for the minnows in there. And then the top had a platform that was propped up with a tangle of branches and the water snakes would sit on those branches and bask. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read a little excerpt from my book because I want to explain this better. To explain me at 15. I fell in love with the physical form of those snakes. At first, I was wrapped over the array of colors present in just a few species, crimson bellies, copper backs, brown bodies, and black bands. Then I noticed the patterns a single swath of pure color, thick stripes at regular intervals, like the shadows cast on the ground in front of a picket fence, or a complex patchwork of squared splotches connected by slender, jagged lines, 
making delicate diamonds outlined in black, extending from the snake's plain tan neck to the tip of its pointed tail. Then I watched how their bodies contracted in tension, released at rest, how minute movements propelled them down into the water or lively across its surface, how simple pulses pushed them forward along a thin branch and let them balance perfectly in the light. Sometimes I would bring a notebook and write. In August, when I was 15, I overflowed with admiration and envy for these creatures, writing, as I watch them, I see the qualities they have that I wish for me, graceful and elegant with every contraction of their powerful muscles. They glide through the water with a superior air. They don't make a sound, but their presence is felt. Powerful and having the ability to bring human fear to the surface with one simple move to strike. They resemble well-respected royalty walking through a room with their heads held high and movements sculpted by grace. Yellow-bellied water snakes evoking ancient Greek statues. Their form is simple, lines fluid, but their facade is stoic. This simplicity is powerful. He wasn't the only one inspired by the graceful lines of snake. Works of art from around the world abound with images of these creatures, redolent with symbolism and beauty. All right, so at that moment, I'm 15, and my worldview has just expanded, right? I could see these elegant forms. I could start to see these connections to art and history. And those connections meant more love, more care, and down the line, more conservation for these animals. But expanding our worldview requires effort. We must actively cultivate reverence and recognition of beauty to help us move beyond fear. So I wanna read a little bit more about what happened at this nature center. And this is a picture from the nature center as it looked at the time that I was there. Um, and this happened one time while I was sitting watching those water snakes at the tank. So, one day, a woman was entering the nature center. She was tall and big boned, but struggled to pull open the heavy wooden doors. She stepped over the threshold. Her gaze rose over the low fossil lined turtle enclosure, past the flighty kestrels, and landed on my beloved water snake. She screamed and then panically repeated, Oh no, oh no, as she backed out the door. The woman was so terrified of snakes that she refused to re enter the building. I was perplexed by her reaction and felt rejected by the disgust she showed for the snakes I love. Yet, research suggests that this fear of snakes isn't uncommon. In fact, some studies suggest that fear of snakes and spiders is innate, harkening back to our days in the trees as petite primates. Children as young as five months old have different reactions to images of snakes and spiders than to those of, say, flowers. Animals elicit more severe phobias in a relatively large segment of the population. Full 5.5% of people have snake phobias. Oh man, that's depressing. To me as a snake lover, this is hard to swallow. So what do we do? Well, research indicates that we can and should intervene, especially when children are young. Teaching children to respect animals, to care for them, not just snakes, will facilitate more connection and less fear of snakes over time. We can also model care and reverence for snakes when we do interact with them. So danger doesn't have to mean destruction and fear doesn't have to mean hatred. So I wanna tell you a story, this is paraphrased from the book. So in 1998, there was a 21 year old American and his father and they took a trip to Peru. And what started out is this like kind of typical organized tour up the tributaries of the Amazon soon became a kind of herping adventure that included like a legit bonafide herpetologist from a Texas zoo. So the tour started in Nauta. This is a common launching point to explore the headwaters of the Amazon, particularly the Nauta Caño, the Nahuapua, and Tigre rivers. And so I just want you to like I'm paint a picture a little bit. Like just imagine this town, right? Like it's got a a dock is a steep, muddy bank. The dock is really like 
just these 20 square duck logs held in place by a thick wooden stake and boats of all kinds are coming up to it, right? You've got these ones with these long thatched roofs. You've got some canoes filled with fish, but you've also got speedboats too. It's just lots of different things happening here. So when the young man and the group of 11 people on this riverboat tour finally are launched, they're just captivated, right? I mean, this is Peru. This is the Amazon. So they've got all these shoreline birds. There's dozens of egrets with those majestically curved white net, a pair of jacanas. These are these dark brown birds with red wild foreheads, a horn screamer. They're, they like sit in the trees, but they're really heavy bodied and they're known for these kind of echoing screams. And the trip progresses and the boat stops at these isolated preserves along the riverbank. And the group is taking short hikes. So the herpetologist is pointing out iguanas that are stretched on branches high in the trees. They find a little stump and it's sheltering a pair of skinny fringed leaf frogs that have laid eggs. And the snakes were totally impressive too. There are these snail eaters and tree boas. And all that herpetological splendor is like tucked in among those spiky yellow and red birds of paradise plants and these really broad leaved, thick veined iodine plants. So I think you're probably getting the sense here. Like this is a great trip, trip of a lifetime for this 21 year old guy. So after the river cruise is over on the last night of the trip, the young man and the herpetologist, they drive 15 miles outside of Quito. So they're like back in the kind of mainland area and they're road cruising for snakes. And they find a few dead on the road and then they spot it. This three foot long snake Along the side of the road, it's bordering a really thick secondary growth forest. And the snake was beautiful. It was patterned with these transverse bands of red and then black and then yellow and then black again and red again. It's also about to slide off of the road into that dense forest. So the young man and the herpetologist, they jump out of the car. And the herpetologist thought from afar that it might be a lampropeltis or a milk snake species. The young man is impulsive. He doesn't want to let this quarry get away as it begins to move. And so he lunges for it. He grabs the colorful snake with one hand and the snake quickly turns and bites the fleshy part of his thumb four times in rapid succession. And he immediately knows he's in trouble for two reasons. First, he saw the way that the snake like forcefully chewed his hand. And second, it hurt instantaneously. There was venom working its way into its body. Turns out, not a milk snake. No, it's actually a South American coral snake, Micrurus lemniscatus. So it's worth mentioning that that old rule, red such as black, friend of Jack, red such as yellow, dangerous fellow, that doesn't work south of Mexico City. So in this case, Red Touch Black is no friend of Jack. So the young man, now, you know, envenomated, and the herpetologist, they're within 30 minutes of Iquitos. Um, at the time, this is a city about 250,000 people, so 1998, filled with these, like, zipping scooters and these three-wheel taxis. Now, at this time, Iquitos is isolated in many respects. It's the farthest inland Amazonian port. It's only accessible by river or air. So when they pull up to the hospital, you know, it's surrounded by cement walls that are embedded with these large panels of chain link fence. And it allows passerbys to see the small complex, the hospital complex within. And these are like whitewashed, hip grooved, one story buildings, it's really small. Um, the hospital staff is really dedicated. They're also relying on glass syringes. There are geckos with free reign poking their heads into the windows and coming out in and out of the hospital at will. And the young man's in this excruciating pain. There's a burning sensation slowly working its way up his arm. So he's admitted to the small but poorly equipped ICU. The pain's reached his shoulder now. The nurses begin to draw butt, blood and administer fluids. And then the sequence of events start to get blurry. The pain in his arm is now 
tremendous. Uh, venom is like breaking down the nerves. It's so painful. It's hard to focus. The nurse gives him opioids, but it actually does nothing for the pain. Give him a couple of vials of anti-venom, all they had available. But this is a bigger guy. He's six feet, one half inch, nearly 200 pounds. Like the sort that box extra, extra curricularly. He needed 10 to 20 vials. So things go bad. Paralysis kicks in. He has double vision because the muscles around his eyes are frozen. He's having trouble breathing and there aren't any ventilators in this hospital. He didn't sleep for two days. And then when he finally did, his dreams were all red hued and they're just filled with this sense of fear and evil. But slowly, after many nights, the dreams became less terrifying. He made friends with the geckos on the wall. He even began to eat some mushy foods. He began to recover. And so you'd think that after an experience like that, one might be turned off by Snape. Not this guy. So we met four years later, taking a tropical herpetology course. The man's now my husband. And he never misses an opportunity to help a snake in need. This is him in action or, or in any or any animal in need. He actually ended up becoming a veterinarian. The point here is that fear doesn't have to mean hatred. It can stimulate curiosity and cultivate deep respect if we let it. So we can and should model that respect, but that's not always something that herpetologists have done well. So I want to tell you another story. This one's a bit longer, but I think it gets to the heart of my message, illustrating a couple of major themes. First is that snakes, fascinating, but we only have a very basic knowledge of them. Another is that developing identities, whether these be environmental or professional or personal identities, which is also another area that I do research in besides snake um, ecology itself, this is a complex process. The other thing is our emotional connections to the creatures around us matters both for the natural world and for the people around us. So I'm going to read you another selection from the book to try to get this point. It's called Ometepe Dreams. So I sat on a lawn chair, a bottle of dark Florida Kanye rum in my hand, and I sang. I sang a song that was not my own and would never be my own, but I didn't know it yet. Deep and throaty, the words burst forth over Lake Nicaragua. I sang about the sky, the stars. I was praying or wishing or daydreaming. There was a boy and a dove in a plastic bag. Only the lyric, thick with desire, and the black depths of rum and the nighttime lake existed. There was little moonlight that night. The inky lake was hiding its many mysteries, some pouring in from 40 different rivers, some trapped when a volcanic eruption closed the lake off from the ocean. Cryptic creatures lurked within the dark waters, bull shakes cruising warm, shallow depths for bony fish and stingrays, swordfish rising silently to the surface at night in search of smaller fish, more than a dozen species of cichlids flashing silver and black, golden-eyed, secretly spawning along the rock-strewn bottom. The lake protected mysterious places, too including 400 islands, one of which served as a 2,000 square foot prison for a now deranged spider monkey. And then of course, the largest island, Ometepe. At 21, I had arrived on Ometepe to study herpetology formally, guided by an energetic neuroscientist from a university in New York and his PhD to be tough as nails girlfriend. Our class included 13 students, eight men and five women. One student would go on to become a veterinarian. Sorry, I met that guy. One a waitress. One a coffee grower in the Caribbean. One a bona fide herpetologist. And another an ecologist. We were bound by a desire to see the world, pursue higher education, and at a minimum, assuage some curiosity about reptiles and amphibians, a.k.a. her. That night, two weeks into the program, I sat alone on the dock with my rum, preferring to contemplate the abyss above and below rather than socialize. The other women had returned to their cabin, a wood plank building covered with green painted sheets of corrugated metal, colorful hammocks 
swung from the eaves and outer posts of each cabin, and wood bunk beds were stacked within. Clothes hung from a line, catching the breeze off the lake. Four or five other cabins, a bathroom, a shower building, and a larger main hall for dining made up this little academic village set in the dry forest. This evening, all the women were in their cabin, and the men were split between their cabin and the main hall, where some students were learning how to implant radio transmitters into the body cavities of northern boas, now boa imperador. I was ready to leave my lakeside melancholy and go back to the main hall to do the same. I stood up, mostly full bottle of amber rum still in my hand. The dockside was dark, but a dim yellow light shone closer to the dirt road that separated the dock and the little academic village. I walked toward the patch of light, habitually looking down and ahead a short distance. A couple feet in front of me lay a medium-bodied snake, stretching two and a half feet long, head slightly raised. The snake sensed my presence. The snake also had beautiful big eyes, dark, thin, vertically-oriented pupils, but I knew it wasn't a viper. It didn't mean, however, that its bite wouldn't be laced with toxins. I stepped forward and leaned down, grabbing the snake right behind the head. I picked it up one-handed, tried to calm it down by wrapping its body around my left forearm, the hand of which was still holding the ball from. I looked at the beautiful snake more closely, and a little thrill ran down my spine. It was a cat-eyed snake, Leptodira annulata. Cat-eyed snakes tend to live in forests and forest edges, and they're often associated with wet habitat. Habitat I found it in was ideal, an open area along the shores of Lake Nicaragua, surrounded by forests. These snakes are nocturnal, and they hunt for food both in trees and on the ground. I had probably interrupted it in its nightly search for frogs, salamanders, and lizards. The species is rear-fanged, meaning that it has grooved teeth at the back of its upper jaw that help subdue prey and release some relatively mild toxins, at least as far as people are concerned. This canine snake was gorgeous, long and slender, golden with dark brown blotches, its head slightly too big for its body. I was excited to bring it to the main building, a new species for us that many of the students would be eager to see. When I arrived at the big dining hall, I set my room down discreetly on a table near the entrance. A few guys and the professor stood over a boa at the back of the room. I strolled towards the group, assuming a calm stride despite the adrenaline coursing through my body. I couldn't wait to share my prize, the beautiful cat-eyed snake now calm in my hands. Hey guys, I caught this near the dock. Two of the guys who weren't occupied with the surgery came over. One of them was Javier. He was so excited over my find that he grabbed the snake from me so he could position it better and take photos. I felt a pang of loss over the takeover of the lovely snake. The next morning, I found that the cat-eyed snake had become an overnight sensation. Students were asking where I found it. Others were impressed that I caught it without being bitten. Javier came up with a look of admiration in his eyes, saying the snake was very aggressive. I realized then that I had been accepted into the boys' club. For that moment, I hadn't realized that the boys' club of herpetology existed. I wasn't aware that I had been lacking membership. It made a difference. Now I was included with a cadre of male conversation in a way I hadn't been before. Now I was among the select group of people chased after whenever a new snake was discovered. The boys club wasn't meant to be exclusive to men, but admittance seemed to be based on feats of daring and danger. All these historically considered typical men. Earlier that week, I had chased after a speckled racer, a gorgeous snake whose blue to yellowish scales each appeared outlined in black. That didn't gain me admittance. It was harmless and I was slow. The cat-eyed snake was different. It was aggressive. It was rare things. I had arrived. The boys club of herpetologists was strong in the research world at this time, particularly among those studying snakes. In the early 2000s, scientific papers on snakes authored by women covered between 10 and 15 percent. Today, that figure is closer to 35 percent. A lot has changed in 20 years, and now many of my male peers work closely with women and other underrepresented groups to create a more inclusive field. Still, among some herpetologists, there's a sense that you're not a real herper unless you're diving after venomous snakes or making otherwise docile ophidians perform and strike. This mentality is particularly evident in cable television programs. I call it the Steve Irwin effect. And in Nicaragua, I was about to see it 
firsthand. The work we were doing on the northern boas was slowly advancing our knowledge of snake natural history. In 2001, not many studies had been done that could accurately track the movements of snakes. At the time, automatic data loggers that periodically transmitted an animal's GPS coordinates weren't readily available to scientists. Instead, herpetologists were just beginning to answer the question, where do snakes go with radio transmitters? At the time, the research that the New York professor was doing was interesting enough to attract the attention of the producers of a quality cable television show devoted to reptiles. You know the type. Show with a guy decked out in safari clothes with plenty of charisma and boldness, constantly being filmed wrangling lizards, wrestling caiman, and inching way too close to venomous snakes. Alternately yelling as he gives chase, or speaking in a stage whisper while sneaking up on some unlucky herp. This particular TV show herpetologist visited Omatepe with a small crew, including a statuesque producer and a burly bearded cameraman. They were interested in the boas. A fearless professor, the equally fearless teaching assistant, and a couple of students, including me and the veterinarian to be, were filmed over the course of a morning riding bicycles on Omatepe's dirt roads and lugging around those unwieldy radio tracking devices in search of northern boas. None of those radio transmitter equipped boas were actually found that day. Hidden among the boulders and prickly acacias. A local man eventually bagged a boa caught eating chickens out of a coop and brought it to our TV star back at the academic village in the jungle. At one point, all the herpetology students gathered in a circle outside the dining hall. The TV show herpetologist pulled the giant northern boa out of the bag and began to describe its natural history. Now, at the time, the northern boa was thought to be a subspecies of the more commonly known boa constrictor. The patterns are nearly identical. Today, we know the northern boas in some populations are often a bit smaller than boa constrictors. They are also known for being a bit quicker to bite. The TV show herpetologist shared some general boa facts. They are nocturnal ambush predators, and they typically constrict their prey of rodents, birds, lizards, and frogs. He also brought up human-wildlife conflict. Boas will eat chickens, and chickens are important food sources on Omatepe. In fact, this is one way that snakes were captured for the study. Even Rodolfo would get snakes that way, like the one that we were circled around. They had been caught eating chickens. Rather than killing it, as might typically happen, these snakes were brought to the biological research station, implanted with transmitters, and released. Through all this explanation, the impressively muscled boa constrictor had been calm but it was time to add that sense of spectacle. The TV show herpetologist started to manhandle the impressive boa, stretching her out along the ground, pulling her back by the tail. The boa was surrounded, encircled by predators. She lunged, striking at movements made by the students in the circle. One strike made, a, made contact with the bottom of someone's hard-soled boot. The thud was sickening. The manhandling continued. At this point, I locked the circle, disgusted by the humiliation of such a proud, impressive boa, and disturbed by human beings' capacities to tease and poke and prod creatures with no voice. This was the first time that the shadow side of herpetology made itself known to me. Since then, I've seen many herpers showing off their supposed fearlessness and bravery by catching snakes that didn't need to be caught and harassing snakes that didn't need to be harassed. While I've caught hundreds of snakes myself, mostly for research to inform snake conservation protection, I generally operate by the golden rule. Do unto others, including snakes, as you would have them do unto you. I don't like to be bothered, harassed to the point of stri striking out, grabbed, or manhandled for others' pleasure. I particularly don't like to be seized by the big hands of potential predators at the risk of having one of my delicate ribs crushed and pushed into my lungs or having my spine broken by the heavy pressure of a foot trying to stop me from fleeing, or being paralyzed by a careless drop after I've bitten someone in fear. There's a cautionary principle at work with this empathetic stance, a belief that snakes feel. We don't really know what snakes think or feel. That being said, some researchers believe that reptiles do demonstrate basic emotions, including fear, aggression, and perhaps even pleasure. In lizards and turtles in particular, researchers have researchers have started to test for basic emotions, but snakes generally aren't included in these studies. 
In fact, animal welfare organizations in England worked together to conduct an initial literature review of scientific evidence for reptile sentience. They conclude that it is well established that the behavior of reptiles can indicate their physical health. For example, ball pythons often delay feeding when they're stressed or injured. Beyond that, the researchers point strongly to the need for more studies. Animal sentient research is an emergent field, especially for reptile taxa. Since we can't effectively communicate with snakes, or perhaps any other animal, we should play it safe, assuming they are at least sentient, assuming that fear and pain are just as scary and hurtful for snakes as they are for us. This isn't easy, though. People just don't see reptiles as being similar to us, and in general, we don't bond with our reptile pets as strongly as with mammalian pets. My experience on Ometepe taught me much about herpetology, not as a scientific discipline, but as a social construct. I grew into awareness of this of the strong aggressive undercurrents of the social structure, of reckless rites of passage, and of childlike disregard for snakes and the way they experience the world. Okay. There's a lot in there, and I want to bring us back for a second and remind ourselves. Why do we care? Why should we care? So let's remember first, snakes are disappearing. For snakes, the world can be a really scary place. Around the globe, researchers have been documenting declines in snake species. There's habitat destruction, fragmentation, mechanized agriculture, illegal harvesting and overharvesting, and invasive species. All these things threaten snakes. And plus, there are threats out there that haven't been well researched. How might climate change affect snake populations? How does the increase in mammalian mesopredators like raccoons and domestic cats affect remaining snake populations? The recent publication in Nature showed that habitat destruction, habitat change, and other related factors in which we humans play a role are the biggest threat for snakes. Habitat loss due to agriculture, you can see the agricultural fields behind my research site here in Illinois, in particular, is a big deal for snakes. So in my own research, I found that snake abundance had declined in Illinois by at least 80% since the 1850s. Most of that probably due to agriculture. In fact, over 60% of snake species today in the world are threatened by habitat destruction from agriculture. But remember, though, this is something we can actually do something about. So livestock and the crops grown to feed them make up 80% of agricultural land. If we eat less meat, we can save snakes too. Okay, then of course we've got urban development and road building, and this is the next threat to snake. It already impacts around 30% of snake species. And again, we can do something. Developing conservation corridors, wildlife-friendly crossings that cross the roads, and growing with nature in mind can help mitigate these threats too. Okay, but some people still need to be reminded of why. Why save snakes? Remember, snakes are critical parts of the food web. They reduce rodent populations that can impact crops and disease. They're of deep cultural significance to people around the world. And also, snakes can be a source of medical advances. And scientists are still discovering new species. So we actually don't want snakes to disappear. We don't want snakes to disappear before they're even discovered either. They're useful and they're meaningful and they deserve respect. And they're also absolutely fascinating. So what does this mean moving forward? We need to remember that snakes are fascinating and we still only have a very basic knowledge of them. It means we need to do more research. We need to understand these creatures, how they interact with the environment, the roles they play, the ecosystem services they provide, their taxonomic relationships, the chemicals they produce, the social relationships they have, and the cultural connections that exist to them. We also need to really get curious. We can get curious about snakes. We can travel, either in reality or through books and literature, to understand how people interact with and view snakes. And we can get curious about people. Why do different cultures view snakes differently? What do those differences mean in terms of interactions with snakes, in terms of the treatment of the natural world, in terms of respect for each other? We can begin to interrogate what those cultural associations with snakes really reveal about our own values. 
So maybe we can do that a bit. And we can explore some known cultural beliefs and associations about snakes. And some of these beliefs might be your beliefs or come from your culture. Others uh, might not, but our world is multicultural and global. And part of our work is to expand our worldview, especially when it comes to snakes. So let's start with the Garden of Eden. Okay. No, I actually am not starting with the one in the Bible. Also, although the Bible doesn't do any favors for snakes, instead, I want to start with another type of Garden of Eden, a biodiversity hotspot. So when we look for hotspots for more than 3,400 of the world's snake species, a few places stand out. Parts of Southeast Asia, spots in South Africa and the Amazon, forests in Central America, but can't leave out Australia. Nearly the whole continent of Australia has been identified as a biodiversity hotspot for snakes. So like most Eden, Australia is under threat. Populations increasing by at least half a million people per year. Roads are being built, and they are definitely contributing to snake mortality. So nearly 10% of snakes seen in one Australian study, um, nearly 10% of those snakes were dead. And you could think about this, like, Australia is a place with road trains. It has those, like, high-speed semi-trucks that are pulling three or four trailers. They stretch 175 feet long. They're cruising at speeds of over 100 kilometers an hour. These are massive trucks. They are the feeding tubes of rural Australia. They're also killer for snakes. But Australia, and it's got about 172-ish snake species, it has three major strengths when it comes to snake conservation, in my opinion. The first is Richard Shine. This is Australia's very own snake champion who's written a masterpiece of a natural history book on Australian snakes. Published articles shedding light on on threats to snake persistence, things like commercial exploitation for food and skins, bounties and roundups, pesticides and chemical contamination, and also habitat loss. But actually, I want to share something that Richard Shine once said. He said, uh, and this is a quote, that being interested in snakes is like supporting a football team that loses almost every game. You are part of a small but enthusiastic minority while everyone else thinks you're crazy. You only have two options open, abandon the unpopular cause or try to persuade everyone else to re-examine their attitude. Shine chose the latter. So a second strength is a sense of humor and a sense of caring. There was a news story published several years ago by a number of Australian news outlets about an amethystine python. This is Australia's longest snake species what you can see here in the picture. It had eaten a little girl's fluffy white and blue stuffed animal cow. So the snake had surgery, had surgery, the stuffy was freed, and the snake was too. What I love so much about this coverage, well, one was it was kind of fun. Like they called snakes danger noodles and they had mentioned that like there's too much to swallow. That was just hilarious to me. But I also love the empathy. The family who saw the snake eat the toy was worried about the snake. They kept an eye on it and they made sure that it got help and that it was released after surgery. So the toy went to boy cow heaven, but the snake, it went back into the wild. Oh, I forgot one thing. So that last strength is the law. So in the Northern Territories, killing a snake can actually cost someone $75,000. You can face up to five years in jail. To me, it's kind of brilliant. But does that mean that people in Australia don't kill snakes? No, they still do. But to start, you know, laws like that paired with education has the potential to lead to some really powerful outcomes. So the other thing I want to mention is that fear has not stopped other cultures from revering snakes and associating them with healing wisdom and creation itself. Um, the Hopi, an indigenous tribe in the southwestern United States, have a long history of reverence for snake. And every other August, on the mesas of the high desert, they have the intimate ritual with snakes that conjures agrarian fecundity. There's a lot of preparations made. 
snakes are kind of corralled from the four directions into a, a central area that is enclosed by cottonwood sticks. Uh, snakes are purified by snake priests using specially prepared water. And songs are sung to the snakes on this last night before the final snake dance until rise, Orion rises in the east. And so one of the things that I want to mention about this is that, you know, there's this day of the snakes and there's a dancing ritual. And after the dancing's finished, the snakes are released to the four directions and they're carrying prayers for rain and plenty. The snakes are serving as messengers to the spirit. And one thing that I also want to note is that um, in 1913, President Theodore Roosevelt observed the snake dance and he noted that uh, many of the tourists did not show the proper respect for the ceremony. Hopi elders shared those same sentiments, and today this ceremony of gratitude and good fortune is largely closed to non-Indigenous visitors. You can see that there's, there's a connection here between our empathy for each other as human beings and our empathy for animals. So I'm to look elsewhere. So Martin Nielsen's a uh, Early was an early 20th century scholar of ancient Greek and Roman religions. He described the importance of snakes in domestic worship in ancient Greece. And there the snake symbolized a house god, a form of Zeus. And it was often given offerings of water and oil and fruit. In Sparta, in particular, the Dioscuri, or twin sons of Zeus, Castor and Pollock, were actually seen as protectors of the home. And so they are also associated with depictions of snakes. So snakes often lived in houses among the ancients, and they were tamed. They were tamed by good care and feeding. In Manoa, uh, snakes in one's home were called the Dioscuri, or sons of Zeus, and they were really guardian spirits. Even in the early 20th century, Nielsen wrote that in the Balkans and Greece, snakes found in one's home were welcome as guardian spirits and greeted as a grand lady might be. In 1940, Nielsen recorded that the veneration of the house snakes still occurred in Europe. He described a man that he knew personally in his own country, Sweden, who offered milk to living house snakes. So what I want to say is, you know, you might, you might as well, I count myself among these people. Those who revere snakes for their mystery and history those who have a soft spot for the underdog, those who can find beauty in unexpected places. For me, inculcation into the cult of ophidians, and that's another word for snakes that derives from Greek, it's rather simple, right? It took a few walks of discovery with a comfortable guide, an acre of old field that yielded hidden delight. And perhaps developing respect and appreciation for snakes could be that simple for everyone if we only gave them the opportunity. So that brings us back to us. We can also do our part. Our emotional connections to the creatures around us matter. And we have the power to teach the next generation. We can emphasize wisdom. We can emphasize precautionary principles and conservation and respect, not just for snakes, but for all creatures, including other people too. All right, well, thank you so much. I hope that you enjoyed uh, this part of the presentation and I'd love to hear from folks that are watching and answer any questions with whatever time that we have left. Nikki, fantastic work. Thank you so much for sharing your book and your stories with us today. Just oh, I, everybody pleasure. can like everybody can drop little clapping hands emojis in the chat for you uh, because that was that was absolutely lovely. So uh, viewers, let me remind you, uh, yeah, drop your appreciations, but also Thank drop you. your comments and questions, because I'm going to turn to you in just a moment to see what y'all are thinking about. Um, Nikki, early in the presentation, you showed us some pictures of uh, screenshots from movies and uh, stuff like that and we're asking about people's associations with them and i thought i'd share a few of the things that came in the first one that i see that came in 
uh, was was okay. So Phil had a funny one. Uh, so the picture of the man holding the snake and like screaming at it. Uh, Phil wrote that that uh, envisioned primal fear of snakes, but also that that person was not too scared to touch the snake. I thought that was kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> and then, of course, you know, lunchtime discovery oh, viewers wonderful. are, uh, you know, our audience is a lot of nature lovers in here. And so we had some people trying to, like, identify the snake species in the images. Uh, and so Jess wrote that it reminded I love them. That, it. Right. Uh, so Jess wrote, it reminds me that rat snakes aren't dangerous and Hollywood is hopeless. And Courtney wrote, I see a non-venomous king snake and wondered if it was from uh, the movie title Snakes on a Plane, which it looked like. Yes. Yeah, so that that was Snakes on the Plane. And um, I did also identify a non-venomous king snake in there as well. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess you got to be safe with it, but... And so uh, go ahead. Well, one of the things that uh, makes me think about is how snakes are still depicted, right? To this day in media, right? You've got movies like Snakes on the Plane, uh, even thinking back to Indiana Jones, right? So oh, why has it got to be snakes? You know, there is there is something still very active in the modern imagination um, around the associations of snakes and fear. You know, it brings me to mind the statistics that you shared about the percentage of people who do have phobias about things like snakes and spiders. And then the research that's pointing to some kind of uh, innate connection to these animals that that we don't like so much. But then I also think about, you know, like it sounds like your experience as a herpetologist and a science communicator and my experience with this and so many of my colleagues, probably people who are watching this program right now, too, is that even at very young ages, you can connect people to snakes and spiders and almost immediately it feels like dispel a lot of the myths and fears uh, and we hope, I suppose, develop, you know, people who have a lifelong respect for for those animals. So while there might be something innate, it's really easy to be like, no, you you just we teach respect and that can happen pretty quickly. Yeah, I don't know if that's been your experience. Absolutely. That's been my experience. There's been a lot of research on kind of environmental identity developments that indicates that education, positive experiences, the role of mentors all have a tremendous effect on the way that we view animals, the way that we view the natural world around us. So even if we do, I mean, we also have, um, there's some evidence to suggest we have a, some of, have a, uh, an innate fear of birds as well, because like, if you imagine evolutionarily, we would have been like teeny tiny monkeys and birds are really big and scary and they would have eaten, you know, our ancestors. But, yeah, you know, most people are able to get over or not even notice whatever this slightly innate sense of how birds are, too. And because we've got tons of positive associations with birds and we invite them into to our house with bird feeders and such, just like the air house with bowls of milk, which I am not sure if snakes really like bowls of milk. I don't know. It's a it's a sweet gesture nonetheless, I suppose, whether they drink it or not. And it kind of gets to a, a question that Michael in the chat was asking too, uh, about the the distinctions between stimulating curiosity about snakes, but also not sensationalizing their habits and what they do. Could you say that again? Stimulating. Uh, Michael wrote, stimulating curiosity about snakes without sensationalizing their habits and actions. Oh, um, I think this is a real, a real tension, right? Um, I think one way that we can avoid the sensationalization is to not use the fear-based imagery. So in a lot of TV shows, you have, constantly have these images of snakes like biting, lunging, right? 
or people like grabbing snakes and being rough with snakes. To me, that um, doesn't really serve any educational function, but it does serve to sensationalize. Korean connection is something a little bit different, right? Um, tends to be a little gentler, a little bit slower, tends to involve more, more fat, tends to involve experiences too, like personal experiences that you might go to the museum and have the opportunity to see a snake in person or maybe even, even touch it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. More for you here. Um, John wants to know if you found rural Nicaraguans had similar or different attitudes towards snakes than people here in North Carolina, for example. Oh, that's a great question. I think in my experience, rural Nicaraguans mm -hmm. had less um, fear and reactivity towards snakes, which is interesting because they have a lot more dangerous species there. You know, it, there are regions of the world where snakes are quite dangerous and, and there is um, a lot of kind of healthcare implications about, because there are so many venomous snakes around. Um, but it also didn't mean that they were inviting snakes into their house. So I think in, in these two places, North Carolina and Nicaragua, um, I maybe found attitudes to be more similar than they are different. Excellent stuff. Okay, uh, next one for you, since we're getting close to the end here. Uh, Bradley, well, I'll read what Bradley wrote and see what you think. Uh, Bradley says, what do you think about the theory that some dimension of people's inherent curiosity with and fears about snakes are tied to the fact that we are under selection to notice and avoid snakes, and that is tied to the evolution of visual acuity. Um, so I only have slight familiarity with this work that I've heard about before, and I think, I mean, it, it does make sense that the, the fascination and like, you know, so these people ask me, like, why, why do you like snakes so much? And I like, if I'm honest with myself, there's a part of it that's because, like, because they are, like, a little scary and also because people don't like them, right? There's just some sort of, like, contrariness inside me that attracts me to them even more because of this. And that's okay, I hope. I mean, for me, I think it's okay. Like, the the underlying um, kind of sociobiological reason of, of where my interest lies with snake, um, doesn't really matter because in the end i hope that the result is increased conservation for these species excellent i think that was a good answer bradley can let us know what he thinks about that one too in the chat uh well nikki a bunch of folks were dropping their appreciations for you um last question of course, what's your favorite species of snake? Oh, it's the fox snake. 100% the fox snake. It's like, it's so beautiful. Fox. They're in central, uh, the central part of the United States, including in Illinois, which is where I grew up. They are brown with these like chocolatey covered splotches. And when you look at their face, there's something about them. They look like they're smiling, but they're big. They're big constrictors, right? They go after small mammals. They're super cool. I, I've never heard of a fox snake, but I'm going to have to go look one up now for sure. Take a look at them. Chris, Nikki. Chris, do you have a favorite snake? Do I have a favorite snake? Oh my gosh, that's a fantastic question. Uh you know, it might be a controversial opinion, but I think the the prettiest snakes that I've ever seen myself are copperheads. Yeah, they're gorgeous. You know, it, it's not hard to find one in Central North Carolina necessarily. They're they're kind of out there. Um, people are afraid of them, and given their commonality, that they, they can be dangerous. Like you can encounter one, and they are venomous. 
Um, but a lot of people that I've talked to about them, people have learned how to identify them, learned their habits, and even when they've had negative interactions with them, uh, seem to come away from it not hating copperheads. Like they've become kind of a part of the nature that lives around us all. Um, but uh, uh, from all of that aside, I just think they're beautiful. The the beige, the dark red patterning that's on them, uh, the way they can vary. Some of like really bright colored, some are darker. Uh, they they I always love to see a copperhead. I'm always looking for them when I'm out on the trails, uh, which just makes people think that I'm a little a little crazy, but. <laughs> I'd love to see them. Oh, that's wonderful, Chris. For me, I love how they blend in with their environment, particularly in, in the fall among the like the brown pine needles and the kind of tannish colored dried beech leaves. Like, mm-hmm. It's just so perfect in there. Cool. They're so good at what they do. Snakes, snakes in general. Uh, you know, everybody on the internet likes to talk about how everything evolves into crabs. Uh, but I feel like everything is probably headed towards, if it's not crabs, and it's towards snakes. Because snakes have figured out how to live their lives uh, with the least amount of limbs and the least amount of energy possible, but still just be a wicked cool about it. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, let's see. Oh, some other folks are dropping their favorite snakes in the chat now, too. We've got we've got a vote for the Decay's Brown Snakes. Just just so you know. Uh, all right. Well, it looks like that's our time. Uh, Dr. Cagle, thank you for being on the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Viewers, thanks for tuning in to today's edition of the program. Appreciate you all joining us. We will, of course, be back here again next Wednesday with another program for you. You can take a look at the chat, links to sign up for the email newsletter to get the link, uh, as well as the website link where you can go read about next week's programs. They're all there. Go give them a click. Go check it out. And while you're at it, you can follow the Museum of Natural Sciences and the Office of Environmental uh, Education on social media, where you can see even more updates about what's going on between our two different departments. Uh, We're going to have a great time continuing next week on the Lunchtime Discovery series. So I hope I'll see you all again soon. Or rather, you'll see me again real soon. And have a great week, everybody. Bye.